Hello, friends, and welcome again to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, where we bring someone else's local meta to you, where in this case, the meta we're bringing to you is the internet. The worldwide meta. The worldwide meta. With our favorite co-host, Shane. Co-host? Whoa. <laughs> That's a, am I the first returning guest? Don't You are me. the first returning wow. guest. It's an honor. Yes, we're very glad to have you back. Uh, so, you know, despite the fact that we're calling this meta the internet, it is a little bit smaller than you think, because today we're talking about TTS, which is Tabletop Simulator. For anyone that hasn't tried it out, which is actually a lot of people, because it could be a lot bigger if a lot more people were into it, Tabletop Simulator is sweet. It lets you play Kill Team with your friends across the world, across the country. In fact, we even have the World Team League going right now, right, Shane? Yeah, right now there's quite there's a couple big TTS events going on right now. There's the World Team League, which is a uh, a big like World Cup kind of thing that I can get into uh, later. And then we're also doing the uh, CPTS Summer or the uh, Command Point Tournament Series, which is hosted on the Command Point Discord and is uh, the biggest uh like tts like international tts scene really nice so i assume the summer league is more uh not the invite because world team league was like an invite with team captains right yeah so the world team league it was i'm not a captain of team usa i was last year this year i didn't want to be because it's a lot of work but um i am on team usa so basically the way it works is uh, the spanish guys really kind of spearheaded this um it is there's uh as many teams as we could put together. Uh, so there's a team USA, a team Spain, a team uh, Peru was organized, a team Latin America, a team Russia, and a team um, Europe. Poland? Oh, team Europe. Yeah, okay. just like the rest nice. of Europe. Um, and so each team has eight players that are like, representing their nation. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, eight times six. I don't even... 48. 48 players, yeah. yeah. That's um, a big... Yeah. And the, basically the way it's structured is there is it's kind of like a team tournament where like you are playing against one person from the other team and no team, no individual team has multiple of the same faction. So when you have eight players, there's actually like a lot of diversity in like what the different regions are bringing. Um, and like you really have to like put the faction specialists on their factions and then like other people that are You know, like if you have a bunch of meta chasers, people are going to have to be good at something, you know, other than whatever the best thing is. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. When it came to something like the New Mexico World Championship, I actively decided not to take Hunter Clay because I didn't want (laughs) to do a bunch of mirror matches. So it's cool that the World Team League is not allowing mirror matches in that way. Yeah. 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 Like a Um, whole team of just cults sounds really stupid. (laughs) Yeah, no. And it. I would have been taking cults, but one of the people on Team USA is actually Blaine from Six Sided Legion, and he is like uh, he loves his cults. So we put him on cults, and I'm running Legionnaires, and I think I'm the only Legionnaires in the whole thing. I don't think any of the other countries brought a Legionnaire. That's player. impressive. Yeah, yeah I mean, bravo on that. Post, per, yeah. post nerf, I guess a lot of people have uh, dropped the Legionnaire for fear of. I guess on open play, they don't want to get shot. Is that the worry? I don't know. I mean, well. They definitely, you know, so their win rate dropped. And I, here's my secret theory. I know we're not talking about Legionary today, but I have a secret theory as to why their win rate dropped. And it's because oh, we can people, talk about whatever you want, Shane. <laughs> people visually saw Nurgle get nerfed, and then a bunch of Legionary players swapped to Zinch, which is still worse. Sorry, guys. Zinch is still worse. <laughs> I think maybe on All in the Dark, Zinch might have a little bit of play because they have the, uh, the nice turn one alpha strikes with the four yeah. APL. But on mixed or on open, you know, the Nurgle reliability of that crit defense save is yeah. still just going to do... It just does so much work. It yeah, does so much yeah. heavy lifting on keeping your 12 wound models alive. Yeah, for the record, Zinch is not bad. It's just, I think Nurgle's so good. Do you uh, have still corn on the roster? I'm just curious. Slanesh. Oh, okay, Slanesh for yeah. a deal with the, the the matchups where you need to get a dude and chain into a couple guys. Yeah, it's like it's for the the stun stuff with Geller Pox, and then it's against shooty hordes that can't shoot into combat. You can charge a guy and pay a CP to stun him, and then suddenly you're halfway up the board and you're totally safe with a shrapnel. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Wait, so hold on. The Slanesh can pay a CP to stun someone, like for anyone, or Basically. does it have to be the Shrive Talon? 
it's not a stun. It's you pay a CP and you pick an enemy operative. I think it's within three inches, but I usually do it in engagement range. And you yeah, just that, boy. yeah, you give that operative minus one APL. And that's a so, Slanesh specific thing. It's yep. Slanesh specific. It's sickening. I'm just out here for... sleeping on Slanesh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's so, that's a good yeah. one. Wow. So yeah. the Shrive does it, and then he he stuns a guy that he doesn't need to kill somebody to do it, and then they can't fall back because they don't have two APL. And they, if they want to fight him, he fights first. Um, so he's just like a beast. He he just gets up the board, and you know, it's cool. Yeah, that's hot. I like that. Yeah, but, so uh, it's yeah. it's called sickening captivation for uh, players who've never seen Slanesh on the board, because I suspect that would be the majority of listeners. Sickening okay. captivation is a Slanesh ploy that lets you m- so basically minus APL from someone within three inches. So having yeah. that allows you to stop Gellerpox from being dangerous when they're because a charging Gellerpox mutant is not super dangerous. And, you know, you're a little bit faster, so you can get to melee, which is nice. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I know. I like Slanesh. I actually, even in my World Team League game against Spain, I took the Slanesh Shrive Talon. Nice. All right, so cool. It's not just like a gimmick thing. I actually play it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I thought that there might be a little bit more play with Korn uh, against Colts or against the Gellerpox because you can yeah. perpetual aggression into some of the dorks. But Slanesh has definitely also got the a fair play of, you know, some, some sneaky stuff. Because the Shrive yeah. Talon, when it kills someone, can also give out minus APL, right? Yep, so I've actually had games against Gallerpox where, like, I charge a bug and kill it and give a Hulk minus one APL, and then there's another Hulk nearby, and I pay a CP to have them both have minus one APL. That does seem really good. It just shuts down, like, half their team. (laughs) That's hilarious, honestly. Whoa, love that. I mean, before we get into uh, talking a little bit more about TTS, I know we've gotten distracted because it's it's super fun to hear about, you know, yeah. the world champion or not the world champion, the World Cups, I guess. Yeah, kind uh, of. we got we just want to toss out a quick reminder to any listeners. You know, we have our discord and our Patreon. And this week we actually have merch from Luster's Workshop. Ooh. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm excited about it. Like, I haven't seen it yet. I just know a little bit of the behind the scenes that like it's something that we've been working on, and that it is something that we're going to have a little perk that is associated with it for the Patreon subscribers, um, and that is going to be a discount code to get your hands on this particular item for free. For free. Wow, what a what? deal. Okay, so what is the item? I, it's going to be a small customized kill team gauge with just another kill team on it because it'll be just another kill team gauge. Just <laughs> another kill team gauge. There it is, friends. If you want to get your hands on that uh, for free through Luster's Workshop, you can sign up for our Patreon and get a discount code to get your hands on that. Nice. But getting That's back exciting. to the topic at hand, Melee <laughs> Summer is yeah. in full effect you know we've got it sounds like a quite a few winners of melee summer in the world team league on the u.s side yeah um both myself and blaine uh fellow cult chaos cult um i don't even want to say the word enthusiast because i hate the <laughs> team really but we did well, he's, play a, he's a chaos cult enthusiast he likes sure. them yeah, i'm not them. a fan of them but um you know that, that's not fair so like, they actually are pretty fun they're cool yeah, I think if they didn't feel so overpowered, it would actually be a very cool team addition because having the idea of like guys who mutate into stronger dudes, having those become like baby nightmare hulks, I think that is cool. It's just they feel very overtuned right now. Which For is, sure. Yeah, I yeah. fully agree. You can rewind a couple episodes and hear my first impressions and that the chaos cult before we knew the rules was was one of my favorite vibe wise. Uh, but yeah, oh, yeah, they are a little they are a little uh, too hot in the meta for me right now. I got to let them cool down before I try to play them. So tell us a little bit about the Summer League. Are there like it's been going for a while or it just started? So it's been going on for like two weeks, I want to say. Um, so the, basically the way that it's formatted, I already said the teams that are in. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. You're talking about CPTS? Yeah, yeah, your your okay. summer team league because yes. I think the world team league we've gabbed a little bit, yeah. but let's talk about you know something that's a little bit more unique to command point because you guys started the tts league yeah you know so for, guess, for the community right which is something yeah. that me and jason do for you know our real life communities but digitally you know that's that's your guys's baby yeah i mean it's a so i mean all the way back to last edition when covid came out um and started you know making everybody's life suck uh that was actually fun fact um our discord 
was initially created uh, just to be a platform for us to run TTS tournaments during COVID. Um, and then it eventually, oh. over time, it became its own big thing. And now it's one of the bigger communities for on Discord for Kill Team. But initially, it was just there so we could run tournaments. Um, and so, like, the first tournament we ever did was the Command Point Invitational way, way back. Um, we ran a big series of tournaments last edition during COVID. And that was, like, all the tournaments that were happening at the time. And it was really cool. Like, we were running, like, we had a major at one point. Um mm. Uh, cause we did BAO over, over TTS oh, and cool. yeah. And then this edition came and, you know, all of a sudden COVID is not a thing anymore, but we, you know, I figured let's, there should still be a place to have, you know, TTS kill team, because there's a lot of people out there that want to play kill team, but they don't have a local meta and what better way to play the game than to play with whoever in the whole world. That you would it's never need otherwise. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, stable internet connection, right? Yeah, all you need, yeah, because the TTS is like stupidly easy to run. Like my computer is a potato, and I've I've seen people run it on like laptops, like completely fine. Um, all you need is a decent internet connection, and even that is, I mean, I've played against <laughs> a couple of people with terrible internet connections, but um, for the most part, it's really easy to play and really easy to run. There's some really good guides on YouTube. If you if you check out our, our Discord, we've got a few pinned in the TTS community content uh, channel. But um, yeah, so like I and I'll admit we were backing off a little bit on the TTS stuff for a little while. And then I did my rendezvous into Marvel Crisis Protocol. And that game has a crazy TTS community. Um, I joined their Marvel Crisis Protocol Tabletop Simulator League. And it had over 400 players in it. And oh. I was like, wow, this should be a thing in Kill Team. Like, this should exist for Kill Team if people want to do it. Yeah. Um, so, so um, yeah. one thing that I want to throw out there real quick, um, for anyone that actually is like TTS, Tabletop Simulator, like, hold on, what are you even talking about? It's actually like its own game that's available on Steam. And then the whole thing is it is just a simulator for tabletop games. And then you can just load games in there that are on um, like the Steam Workshop and like load in mods and then you can play like whatever game on there. So like this isn't just a thing for Kill Team. Um like Shane said, there's Marvel Crisis Protocol is available there. Um you could play chess, you could play Monopoly, you could play whatever you want. Um it's yeah. its own thing and then specifically we're talking about the mods to play Kill Team on the tabletop simulator on any kind of computer. Um I play it on a Mac too, so it's not just for Windows. Like you can play tabletop simulator on a Mac. Yep. Um Yeah. I've and actually met a lot of players who I think at large tournaments, there's a lot of players who are coming in from smaller regions or, you know, places where they just have one other friend they're playing with. So they don't really get to see a meta. And I know a lot of them have played TTS probably through command point would be my guess. And that's where they got a lot of their practice games before these large tournaments. So it's not like this is just, you know, a small thing. This is a pretty large community at this point. Maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not Marvel Crisis Protocol large. No. It's nowhere near that. I think it has the potential to to get uh, like better, like bigger sized tournaments. But right now, I mean, it's um, so after like coming back, you know, well, after seeing the MCP TTS scene, I, I was kind of inspired to um, push it forward a little bit and kill team. And so I, I started the command point tournament series or CPTS, as it is referred to on the discord. Uh, if you're on the discord, you've probably seen notifications for it and are like, what the hell is this? Um but yeah, the CPTS is the Command Point Tournament Series. It is a league that goes on every, um, like, it's quarterly. So there's usually, if there isn't one going on, there will be one going on in a month or two at any given time. So right now, it's the Command Point Tournament Series Summer. So it's running through the summer. Uh, basically, the way it works is um, you sign up. It, it, there's a North America bracket, and there's a Europe bracket. And you sign up for you know whichever you don't if you live in north america you don't have to play in the north america bracket it's really about whatever your time zone and whatever works for you basically um and you play a five round typically it's been five round swiss but it depends on the amount of players and at the end of the swiss uh the top four players in each bracket um in each region i guess join into a uh like a top eight uh like single elimination uh, like the finals pod yeah 
And is, is there a game limit for the summer league or is it a kind of like a free for all situation? It's uh, so it's Swiss pairings through the first round or through the first uh, part of the tournament. So okay. um, this like right now uh, we've got 36 players total. So it's GT sized at the moment. Um, okay. And we're just uh, we're, we're playing through. We're in the second round right now. It's, it's nearing the end. So we're about two weeks in and there's three more weeks of Swiss and then it'll be three more weeks. So the, is um, it is it like a GT where once you pick a team you're locked into the team for the yes. the like three months? Okay, all right. Yeah, the only thing that we have started uh, introducing is if you make top four and you get to the top cut, then you're allowed to tweak your roster. Which for some teams that doesn't matter. For some teams it does matter. Um, just to like you know to to account sometimes if there's a balanced data slate midway through the tournament, we'll usually apply it during the next round. And so for some teams, you know maybe the data slate will affect how they want their roster to be if they make top four really like inquisition warp coven and legionary basically as the yeah. primary teams where this actually would make make a difference at the moment yep um and i've got uh you know we've got two to three tos for both north america and then two to three tos for for europe and we've got a role in the discord called inquisitor so if you're playing in the tournament and you're having like a rules dispute you can go into the chat and you can tag add inquisitor and somebody like um, it's rules knowledgeable people can come in to your voice chat and like resolve whatever judge dispute you have. And that was an idea I stole from the MCP scene because they have a uh, they have a thing too. I it's like celestials or like something like you should, that. You should sign me up for to be part of the Spanish <laughs> the Inquisition. I need I'm that. down. I need that actually. I, I, do, do that I need actually. more more judges. It's basically yeah. a judge role. Yeah, I could um, definitely, I could definitely do that. Just yeah, if like if you're free and you see the tag and you're an inquisitor, you can be like, oh hey, what's the rules dispute? I can help you. Um, yeah. And it's like a, it's like a more structured way to run a tournament. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, the way that the pairings work, I guess I kind of glossed over that, but I mentioned it's weekly pairings. So on Monday, you get paired against your next opponent, and you and this opponent have until you have the whole week to just schedule your one game. And then by the next week, the next pairings will come out. Um, so it's and typically if you're in the right bracket, it should be doable to to find that match throughout the week. Sounds cool. That sounds that sounds pretty good. Are you guys actually putting on BCP for as like an official tournament or is this? No, offline? we don't put it on BCP. Um, we used to do one day tournaments that we would put on BCP, but but not anymore. We run it through challenge, um, challenge. Mm. I don't know how challenge. Yeah, with an yeah. O. <laughs> yeah. So uh, BCP is a little weird with TTS and weird with especially long term tournaments. Um, and the way it like breaks into like a bracket is also it would just like you'd have to make two events. That's true. So, um, but challenge has been pretty easy to 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 run for for the events so far. Um, it's got a, enough. We used to run it on, I think it was tournament. Um, yeah, yeah, I've used I've used challenge to reasonable success at my for my like small time magic tournaments. I think we use challenge because mm -hmm. it it's all built in and it it works reasonably well. Yeah. Do you find that the uh, online meta is substantially different from the perceived meta that you know people like can you roll a crit or um, other people that talk about tier lists have or um, yeah, like oh, tell us yeah. tell us about the digital meta on TTS. Yeah, so I mean, just like any other meta, the TTS meta, while being you know it's bigger than your average meta for sure, um, is it's got its own little like ecosystem of of what teams are doing well and stuff. So at the moment, uh, there's a lot of chaos cults in the North America bracket, which was kind of expected. Um, but before that, I mean, going all the way back to the first CPTS we did um that was won by ace so like the best players okay. in the world yep. have played on tts um and ace won with vet guard and then we did the second one um and uh mm -hmm. a player named micromancer won with Wormblade, which was like pretty cool um but af after that i'm trying to think vet guard have won like three of the six cpts tournaments including the last one cpts um spring Okay, which is like kind of weird, uh, but I mean, Vetguard have always been good, so it's not that weird. Um, I think Vetguard have always been basically an S tier team, and they've never yeah. not been S tier. They're just very powerful and remain yeah. very powerful. <laughs> yeah, Vetguard have have historically done very well on CPTS events. Um, I'm trying to think of the other turn, the other teams that have won. So we've had a Wormblade win. We've had a few Vetguard wins. And... Sounds like more than a few Vetguard. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think what the other one was, but I'm like totally blanking on what the other winner was. Um, but no, I mean, this, this year it could very well be a, or this season, it could be a, a cultist player. I mean, that's, would not be okay. shocking. <laughs> Is there any uh, Felgor representation across the the TTS scene right now? I believe there is. Yeah, uh, actually, I can just uh, take a look and answer that for you right now. Um, let me just hop into our little document we've got with all the rosters on it. Um, but I mean, it's typically it's. I, I know that America has. A lot of cults. Um, there's some Inquisition. There's some Corsairs. Um, actually, there's there's quite a few Inquisition as well. Um, cool. I don't see any Felgors at all in North America, which is kind of crazy. Um, and in Europe, let's take a look. We have got some... Well, actually, Europe meta looking way more interesting. We do have a Felgor. Um, Are you saying some, that Americans aren't creative? <laughs> Uh, now right now they're they're not looking too creative. We've got a warp coven, a casserkin here in Europe, a far stalker kin band. Wow. Um, but yeah, no, I mean it's uh it's the meta changes every every you Actually, know season. one one question I realized I didn't even ask are how are are the world team league and some uh, summer CPTS are they both mixed or are they all open? What's the they're format? both mixed. So the current format on CPTS and we we had this format last season as well is the five round swiss goes open uh into the dark open into the dark open and the nice thing about tts is you can guarantee that whereas a, at a normal tournament you might end up on one more than the other and some players will be on open this round some players will be on into the dark this round uh whereas on in in cpts it's it's locked as to what you're playing the only thing that changes is the the layout which you roll for at the beginning and um the the other thing that changes on open on the first round uh we do octarius and on the third round we do chalnath and on the fifth round we do vertigus because oh, um cute. one of the community members put together like a crazy awesome map pack with like every type of terrain set and like uh all adjusted for the the eight or i guess the ten nine ten maps oh that's cool so there's like fully customized boards for yes. each of the layouts that's yeah really cool. it's actually really cool with like the way that the maps work in tts you can basically just like click to load and then it just pops up and it's all set up and then all the terrain is locked in place so you can't like bump it around accidentally um which you know like tabletop simulator actually does have some cool table physics and stuff so you can like you can bump things which is kind of funny um but yeah like the train is all just like click to load it and it's locked in place and it's great yeah are there any big trips or like um what is, what is maybe one of the best things about tts in comparison to tabletop versus and then in the other way around like what do you prefer in person versus what do you prefer on tts so on in TTS, the nice thing is it is extremely precise. Like in, in a tournament, you're going to have, you know, instances where somebody mismeasures something and it just never gets caught because, you know, they're on the other side of a table. There's a bunch of terrain in the way. Um, whereas on TTS, like you can, you know, you pick up your model and you move it and it's showing you the exact, you know, amount of inches to the, like the... <laughs> to the, the decimal yeah, okay. yeah um that your model moves and and the other thing too is there's a button that you can click on the table called uh save positions and if you've put your team on the little board and hit the button um when you move a model uh say you move a model and you're like oh i don't actually want to go there you know i was just measuring something out you can right click on them and hit load position and it will throw them back exactly where they were when you hit save positions, which is the craziest thing ever. Um, so like you can, you can really like pre-measure stuff like really accurately. Um, the downside to that is sometimes players are a little too meticulous and we're going to combat that probably starting next season with um, like more enforced clocks just so games don't go too long. Wow. Um, like I think the last grand finals in CPTS went like three hours long three and a half hours long. Um, and it was between Corsairs and Vetguard. And this uh, season, we're enforcing chess clocks for the playoffs. Not for the Swiss games, but just for the top eight playoffs. 
Um, so that, that won't be a thing anymore. Thank God. Um, and you know, I mean, obviously in real life, uh, you know, you get to see the actual, like your real painted model sitting there and nothing replaces that. But, um, people have made some really nice scans on TTS where they scan in their like real model, take a bunch of pictures of it and then import it into TTS. So like the models I'm using are like actually really nice looking. (laughs) Yeah, I've been really impressed with a lot of the the t- models on TTS. Um, and then I also just wanted to throw in another cool note of the precise measurement thing, where one of the other features, you can hover your mouse over a model, and then you can type something on the number pad, like a number, and it'll put an aura of whatever number you typed around them. And to make it go away, you just like type zero, and it makes it all go away. So like if you're positioning your medic, you hover your mouse over the medic, you type three, you get your little three-inch bubble, and then as you're moving, that bubble follows the medic around so it makes it really really easy to like plan for auras and like you can do the same thing for engagement range with a one inch aura and just like put the one inch aura on someone that you're trying to charge and be like can i make this with the barricade in the way and all that kind of stuff and just like there's a lot of cool things like that with the precise measuring between um like shane said when you move a model it shows you to the decimal exactly how far you're moving it and then like creating the auras and the save positions and everything like it's it's really really clean and it's a very satisfying experience yeah that's a really good shout jason i totally forgot about that but yeah i mean it the precision on tts is like next level you really don't have to worry about models getting knocked or like something getting mismeasured like basically ever it's, yeah, it's cool. absolutely. Um, and then one of the other things that actually that I learned from TTS that carried over into my real game is there's just like a ton of game aids on TTS, like all of your all of your ploys and like all of your equipment and everything there's cards for like digital cards that you can move around. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to make my own like little I'm going to tr- convert my ploys into cards and then I'm going to bring that like when I actually play a physical game on the actual table and then it's easy to keep track of like what of your strategic ploys are active by putting those cards face up and putting the rest of them face down and just like a bunch of little workflow things like that that I learned from TTS I brought over to my real game as well yeah there, I actually have a player locally um, who James who plays Felgor and he prints out all of his cards for all of his ploys and he turns them like face up face down and I found that to be pretty good and I've seen it on tts as well so i for anyone who's learning how to play or trying to make sure that they remember things physical printouts so you can externalize parts of your thought process are really helpful yeah no that it's it's really nice having like all the all the ploys and equipment just like a click away and they just pop up and (laughs) the the current mod table um i don't know exactly who's working on it at this point but the the mod table that we use is just awesome and the people that work on it put so much work into it and and it's gotten i remember when tts kill team first started being a thing and we were just it was so jank and like we we barely had we didn't even have a dice roller we would just like 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 we'd like pick up a bunch of dice and hit r a bunch of times so they'd like roll into the air but now like there's a dice roller and like you can click a button you can like that says three and it'll spit three dice out and then you drop them into the box and it, it like randomly generates a role for you. And it's just everything is so streamlined now and it's so easy too, which I think is a lot of people don't get into TTS because I think it's like kind of intimidating or but clunky. It is, yeah, yeah, that too. But it's gotten a lot less clunky and it's it's gotten a lot easier to to actually use the the software. Yeah, it really has. One of the other things that's really cool is the user interface that's built into every single model. So like the engage and conceal and ready and not ready is baked into it where there's just a little icon that's like connected. Also, there's a health bar and it's so it's connected to the health bar. Um, When a model takes injuries, you can just click on the health bar to unlock it. Click plus or minus until you get to the number you want and then click it again to lock it Um, when a model is... um, ready or not ready you click on the little icon to flip it between orange and gray and then you can right click it to switch between engage and conceal and then there's also just a master button that's ready all operatives so at the end of the turn you just go boop everybody's orange now we're ready for the next turn um and that's also just a really cool feature definitely yep. big shout out to whoever's doing all the behind the scenes work there i am very impressed very cool very cool lots of tts stuff Sounds like it's time for us to do our operative showdown. That's right, folks. 
It is time for the Operative Showdown. Operative Showdown. And I, I'm excited. <laughs> and, you know, since we've got recent silver golden ticket winner, Shane, you know, we wanted to ask him post data slate, what's better between the Blessed Blades and the Iconarch? Or maybe the Blessed Blades and the Mind Witch, if the Iconarch is just too good. Yeah, Tell us your thoughts. It's, it's not even close between the Iconarch and the Blessed Blades for me. Um, you know, the, the nerf to the icon arc was, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely, a, it, it, it's there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's slightly different now. Um, it's the bare minimum, I guess, of, of what it kind of should have been on release, like the damage reduction minimum three. Um, but the model is still absolutely bonkers. It's still able to kill things that it has no business killing. And against a lot of things in the game that, the damage reduction is still immense. Um, the Blessed Blades, so I, I'm lower on the Blessed Blades than, like, I've talked to Blaine a lot, and Blaine really, he likes the Blessed Blades. Um, for me, personally, if I actually had the option to swap them out for two more cultists, I would, um, just to have more ways to mutate. But, uh, you know, the Blessed Blades aren't terrible. They they are, like, they have the potential to hit really hard especially if they're in range of the Icon Arc, they're 4-6, becoming 5-7. Um, and they're 8 wounds, you know, which is cool. Um, and they can GA too, so on, on Into the Dark, you know, that's definitely a cool thing. Even on Open sometimes. But uh, sometimes I'll give one a crack grenade. But generally speaking, if I'm on a board where, like, like I'm on Open Board and there's not enough, like, the deployment zone isn't, it doesn't have enough stuff for me to hide everybody and, like, maybe I have to leave two guys out the two guys that are getting left out in the open are the Blessed Blades. Those are the two guys I'm most comfortable dying on turn one. Um, yeah, so that's my take on it. But between the Blessed Blades and the Mind Witch, it's more of a discussion for sure. Yeah, the Mind Witch definitely. I you know I tried the team for the first time very recently, and the Mind Witch did a lot of work. There was a sneaky play where I gave someone minus one APL while they were stuck in combat. Mm -hmm. which was very neat because it let a torment score a point that they didn't look like they were going to be allowed to. Yeah. So that was nice. And the Blessed Blades, you know, for what it's worth, having the mixed activations is pretty nice. But ideally for the cults, you're really hoping to get the strong turns three and four, and you do need devotees around for that to happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about how much I like the Mind Witch. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Mind Witch is pretty sweet. Um, I uh, So the nice thing about the Mind Witch, so I always try to deploy her, or him, him I'm going to say her. It? In, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a brain. I try the, to deploy the blood is going thing. into the brain from the guy behind yeah. it. <laughs> that creature. I, I try to deploy it in a spot where it is, you know, obviously in cover and concealed, but like overlooking a part of the board. Like it has a visibility of something. Like it's not just hiding behind a wall. Because I, I like to do the minus one APL because the thing about Chaos Cult is because you're all melee and players are learning this, the smart thing to do is to go all engage. Oh, yeah. But if, if you go all engage, then you're going to probably be in line of sight of the Mind Witch who can give you a minus one APL. So sometimes you can see an Alpha Strike coming and you can be like, no, that will not happen to me because I'm you're engaged and you're in my line of sight now. Um, and then also I'll drop at ideally later in the turn if there wasn't you know a cause to activate him earlier um i'll drop the big malefic vortex and drop a couple mortals down on uh on the enemy which you know it's only one mortal well i guess two mortals if you drop it on a guy that's already activated but that can be huge for like damage breakpoints. like if you drop it on a legionnaire suddenly he's got 10 wounds and he's in two shot range of a torment that gets one crit because you know rend is rend yeah, so like it opens up damage breakpoints, it creates chip damage, it's just really nice. And then usually on turn three and four, I'll start to move the Mind Witch up to try and threaten the um, the exploding Mortal Wounds spell within six inches. Like I used that to just like, like there was a, a Harlequin with four wounds uh, within like range of that guy. So I just walked him up within four inches and said, hey, that Harlequin's dead because it's three mortal wounds plus d3 so you're just dead it's just a super um, pistol yeah it's crazy good um 
So I really like threatening with that. And in fact, in the Cult Mirror match, this is hilarious, but because of the auto hit ploy, I actually was able to kill something in melee with it. <laughs> oh. And uh, he was concealed behind cover when he got charged. Um, and he, he, the thing that charged him had one wound left and he was alive. So I had the auto hit and I just bonked him and revealed Robin Ransack and just hit him in the back and scored that, um, which was really funny. That sounds, uh, that sounds like a disaster for yeah for Nixie <laughs> yeah for poor Nick, um but no I like the mind witch and I the my other favorite thing to do is uh, if my opponent is playing recon tech ops I'll deploy the mind witch where I think it'll be able to see where that um recover item is gonna go and then he'll minus one APL the guy that would be running up to grab it so that way they can't move and pick it up they can just move and stand on it and that way. When they do that, then a cultist runs up and prevents them at the end of the turn and prevents them from scoring uh recover item. Nice. Um, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean the mind witch is a great utility piece on the cults. One of many things that are great on the cult. Yeah. It's just some I was talking to somebody the other day about how it's funny that like you look at Warp Coven and how the sorcerers have to pay a CP to use multiple spells, but like the mind witch can just like sit here and just throw out spells because it's not one action. Um Yes, I like, think them and also the Necrons also have the ability to cast multiple spells. Yeah, they can. Yeah, yeah. it's sick. Yeah, so you gotta it's, do it's something with all that APL. <laughs> yeah, even post buff, you know, Warp Coven still have their shackles on. Yeah, like I think if Warp Coven were made today, the you know, psychic action wouldn't be an action. It would just be the three psychic spells you picked from your discipline would be their own action. Yeah, I guess Legionary also have the same restrictions, so it's not like it's uncommon. Yeah. It's just these newer releases have really unshackled restrictions in a lot of senses, yeah. and Colts definitely got a big boon. I think also the can Felgor cast multiple spells? Yep, if they he can still. Yeah, um, he's definitely. Strong. Yeah, so it's like, and, and you know, it goes both ways too, because for a while it was like. Well, there was the spotter that was out on day one for Vetguard, and they've released worse versions of that. So there's some things that were stronger in the early days that they've toned back, and there's other things that they've boosted, um, like for like what we're talking about here. Yeah, that's true. They've made psychers a little bit less conditional, and then they've made um, they've made a lot of uh, seeking like the options on seek and destroy and archetypes a lot easier. You know. Warp Coven have this restriction that is no longer there. And Chaos Cults have Seek and Destroy and Infiltration. I think you use Seek and Destroy. I actually think that Infiltration is quite good on them. But I, I actually use the same three tack ops every game at ACI. I used Robin Ransack, Route, and Tear Through. You know, Tear Through is a good one. For tear anyone who doesn't know, Tear Through is a have two torments next to your opponent's drop zone. And if the game is going well, they'll be there. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 when I played against Nick in the mirror match at ACO, the only difference in our tech ops was he took Eliminate Guards and I took Route. Um, and at the end, he was not able to get Tear Through. I was. And neither of us, I didn't score Route and he didn't score Eliminate Guards, so neither of us got that one. And I got my Robin Ransack because of the Mind Witch bonking somebody and he never got it. Um, so that was like the main difference, I think, was was those four points. Yeah. So outside of the C-suite, you know, we've got this Mind Witch who's quite good. We've talked about the Iconarch lightly because he's just too good. And then the Blessed Blades. I assume the Demagogue has got to be up there because he's got the mutant ability and you need the extra mutations on the team for sure. Yeah, the, the Demagogue's pretty cool too. Um, I mean, I will say one thing about this team is they have a lot to do. The team's not hard to pilot, um, really, but even if they were hard to pilot... um. I, you know, like I can see in a world where they're hard to pilot, but they still have a pretty high ceiling is what I'm getting at. Um, like the different things you can do with the demagogue is pretty cool because a lot of people just use them as like a mutation bot and you should be mutating with them, you know, at least the first two turns. But um, most of my games, my demagogue, I'd put him in a place where I wouldn't want to move him for like the whole turn one or two. Yeah, yeah. Or ideally most of the game. Because I want to mutate somebody and then tell somebody to dash. Yeah. Because you can effectively give somebody like an 11-inch charge. Because if you tell them to dash, 
before they activate. And then that's just three extra inches of movement that they have. And all of a sudden you have a charge that you didn't have before. And your opponent's like mind blown by that. Um, but yeah, uh, stuff like that is really cool. Um, it, funny enough, in my game against Nick Craven, he, I, I put my icon arc in a spot where his icon arc on turn one wouldn't be able to get to me. And we were like, well, he technically could if the leader walked over and told the icon arc to dash. And I thought about it and I'm like, he's not going to do that because then he did not mutating. So I just moved the icon arc there and then he decided to do that. So he, he didn't get a mutation, an extra mutation on turn one, which I think spilled over through the game, but he was able to threaten in a way that, you know, you would not be able to normally by doing that dash. Yeah, so for players who don't know, the Demagogues can has three separate, basically, spells, is what yeah. it feels like. Yeah. One of them is a free fight, one of them is a mutation, which is the keyword for the cults, and then the last one is to take a dash or a charge. And he's also got a fairly good melee weapon, it looks like. I don't know if I ever got mine a melee, so I'm, I can't even... It's yeah. like 3-6 or something weird. It's it's four attacks on fours, 3-6, with stun, yeah. and it's got a pistol, and it's got a it can bonk people on the head. So it's pretty, yeah. pretty solid, solid dude. So if you charge him, he could, he could easily survive by just he carrying could. out and stunning. Definitely survive, especially with the injury aura. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, no, the demagogue has a lot of cool play. And I think that's one of the, I mean, cult yeah. is, you can only do cult so much differently than the next cult player. But I think that's probably one of the things I was doing a little different. And I think Nick too, me and Nick were really emphasizing that that extra movement you could get from the demagogue. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. I haven't really when I played it, I I think my demagogue mostly just mutated and ran ran around. I think he might have even gotten shot on turn two by an orc commando and just got killed from across the map because yeah. I had a very open deployment. So yeah. it was a little bit well, hard to recover. The nice thing too is even if he does get shot, which uh, usually sometimes depending on the board, you can deny it. Sometimes you can't. But even if he does get shot, if you have a cultist nearby, he can jump in front and take the shot <laughs> for a CP because yeah. this team just has everything. They do save your protocols. Have it all. I think that's, you know, that sounds like a lot of the operative showdowning. Yeah, we really I think, I think let's get the into the, uh, the next segment, Jason. <laughs> that's right, friends. It is time for the next segment, which is Hometown Heroes. In this case digitally yeah so hometown heroes basically it's just like people in the community um that you want to shout out like people that have contributed big things um people that are fun to play against um people that are very active or you um, know just people that are your hometown heroes you know the people that show up regularly on the internet i know there's you know we've got the thunderdome rules thunderdome people you know marin yeah. Or Sigma, so you know, just talk about your favorite community members. Tell us their yeah. tell us their tales. I guess as far as TTS goes, uh, one guy I want to shout out is Micromancer, uh, and he's probably honestly he took a big break around the time that I did, um, and he went and played Infinity for a while, and now he's he's coming back. He's playing in the current CPTS, but uh, Micromancer, I think uh, he's he's shaking the rust off right now for sure. But I think when he was playing actively, he was like probably one of the best players in the world just like period and he doesn't play outside of tts he just doesn't he just doesn't have the time to really get out he doesn't have like a huge local scene he's over in like west coast canada um awesome guy nicest dude ever you'll probably see him on the discord if you're active there um really really smart guy and uh really nice to play with uh i've i've played so many games with micro he was my he's my rival in the last edition him and i went back and forth on in, in tournament games on, on TTS. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, the discord is filled with awesome people. It's, it's, I, I can't even like begin to <laughs> think of anybody in particular, just cause there's like so many, but, um, no, the check out the rules questions chat. People are really helpful there. Um, a lot of, a lot of fun discussion, uh, takes place in those, in those, cha uh, those channels. Um, sometimes it's more fun to read than it is to take part in, but <laughs> we already discussions to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. I want to shout out Austin powers because he's put out some great resources to help with learning TTS. And like, he was one of the first people that was like, had the patience to, to help me get started. 
Um, so that was really great. And just in general, it's, it's cool. You know, I've seen a handful of people reach out on the discord servers asking for if anyone's willing to help out. And I've seen people step up and help out with like getting people started, getting people learning TTS. And I just think that's great. Yeah. Austin also has a very good, uh, guide to tabletop simulator, um, that is pretty up to date and he's got a YouTube channel. That's uh, pretty good too. He does a lot of like bat wraps from his TTS games. He like live streams them. Um, yeah. And Austin is a guy that you'll never get to play with in real life, probably because he lives in Japan. Um, so how crazy is that? And I'm actually paired against Austin this week in CPTS and he's playing cults and I'm playing higher tech. So uh, it's been fun, guys. <laughs> it'll be it'll be rough. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, the cults matchup, huh? He's going to he's going to learn. I do deserve it. Yeah, I actually tried getting Austin to help us do a bat rep for one of our invitationals, but it was a, a little much. So definitely recommend his YouTube channel if people are interested in seeing someone play some uh, TTS from someone who's experienced. Yeah, as he's a, a cool guy. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm on a couple of those. Uh, I was playing like Kasserkin at the time, getting smoked. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm on a couple of his bat reps, too. Um, he's, he streams a lot of games. It's, it's fun to watch. Um, and he like really walks through... Because he live streams his games, so he's like, when his opponent is thinking through their their plays and it's not his turn, Austin will like, like narrate what his thoughts are basically as the game's going on. And he's a pretty good player, so it's it's cool to hear that like dialogue, that internal dialogue, um, that is uh, you know that's going on. It's it's good content for sure. Are there any um, players who started like? very recently that you want to like shout out as uh doing well or maybe i think lazarus you mentioned one of the spanish guys was setting up the world team league is he i know i've seen his name quite a bit he's got to be one of the digital heroes huh uh well so the thing is i can't so that you noticed earlier i said that it's the biggest like international tts scene i only say that because spain has their own tts scene that's like definitely bigger because the spanish scene like really embraced tts uh, um, so a lot of the Spanish guys don't take part in CPTS because they're also doing the Spanish league that they do over on their server. So if you speak Spanish, you can go play there. Um, and that's an option as well. Uh, but so Lazarus doesn't tar- take place in the, in the CPTS too often, but, um, he, he is one of like the top players in Spain though, just like in general. Oh yeah. Um, he places really well over there. Um, I think he placed well with Corsairs at the last year's largest tournament, if I remember correctly. He was like the only undefeated Corsairs player at their crazy eight round tournament last year. Something. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Um, as far as like another guy that comes to mind, that's been, that's I've watched become like a very good player. Uh, there's a Russian guy in the server uh, named Fior. And he's the current reigning uh, CPTS champion. Um, very good vet guard player. And he's he's actually like one of the... He's top five on ITC right now because he's just been crushing tournaments over in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, nice. And uh, hey, hey, he might get a golden ticket. if the, I don't know if they're getting an event out there. I know a lot of... I know Poland is. Um, I don't know if Russia is getting one. But uh, he is very, very good. And it's he's very active on the Discord. Cool guy. Yeah. I mean, the hometown heroes are definitely wide and varied, especially when you're on the Internet. You know, you got yeah. hometown heroes from Russia, got Spain, got Japan, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. Just a, a whole horde of cult players in the U.S., huh? Yep. Uh, right now. The villains, yeah, the villains, as it were. Well, hey, maybe maybe I'll give Austin a, uh, a lesson in the Hyrotech matchup. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unlikely, but, you know, we'll see. It's a good segue to our this week's niche tactics. That's sure. right, friends. <laughs> We're moving right along into niche tactics. Niche tactics. So you said higher techs got a good chance against cults, huh? Why don't you talk us up, Shane? Because I'm right, super well, curious to hear about this sweet well, hold Necron on action. <laughs> hold on now. So I did say before we started recording that I think they might have a decent matchup in a cult after the nerf. Um quote unquote nerf to the iconarch. Um so I don't think it's like a winning matchup by any means, but I do think that higher tech has one of the best, if not the best, alpha strike in the game. I don't think it's the best, but it's one of the best. Um 
with the Chronomancer and his Ion stave. So before the nerf, uh, the damage reduction was to a minimum of two on the Icon Arc. So the Ion stave is damaged three, three, five attacks on threes with stun. Um, so if you, your Chronomancer who can fly and has three APL and can have four APL can like recon dash up, steal an APL from a guy for a CP and then fly down the board and blast the cult team pretty like reliably um beforehand though when you hit the blob your freaking ion stave went to damage two two which is just like nothing it's just a bunch of nothing um but now if it's three three you're actually like killing things like three hits kills anything yep. almost two straight hits yeah. is gonna injure leave things at one pretty easy yeah and you're stunning them too which is big so like you move dash shoot the whole team ideally and then you drop the nano mine, which the nano mine is pretty good against a melee team. And you score your recon tack ops and get as many points as you can in the first two rounds. If you get lucky, maybe you can try to win a flank um, and just like turtle and hold on to a onto a lead and stop them with the nano mine from getting their seek and destroy tack ops. While you get at least some of your recon tack ops, you don't need to get all of them. You just need to get more. Um, and that's the theory behind the matchup is to just blast them on turn one, weaken them, and then slow down the march as much as you can um, with uh, with the Chronomancer. And you've got a backup death mark to go snipe someone out, right? That's a thing, too. Uh, I So actually, I'm not sure if I like the death mark in that matchup because he's the one thing I will say about the Immortals, especially if you give them the lethal five, is a they're not really like. Like a cultist can't for sure charge an immortal and expect to live. Whereas if they oh, charge yeah. a death mark, they can for sure live. Um, but the other thing too that I like about the matchup is you can um you can have the uh Despotech get the chronometron from the apprentice. So that gives him plus three inch movement and a five up feel no pain. And you can use intractable march on turn one, which means if your guys are engaged, they get plus two inches of movement. Well, the immortals, at least. They go to normal movement. Instead of four, they go up to six. Yeah. And against cult, cult's a team where you can go full engage because they don't really have any shooting to threaten you with. So you go full engage with your immortals. You give the despotech the chronometron to give him a nine-inch move. And then you have the accelerator give him three APL. So that way he has the potential to move 12 inches and shoot something on twos with balanced basically um and that's like one of the few ways you can actually like kill a mutant uh which if you can kill a mutant that's like huge for turn one against um geller pox and on math uh a despotech with a goss carbine or a goss blaster whatever it's called goss blaster can add, it's like 76 percent chance to kill a mutant and like i'll take those odds <laughs> Um, I was just about to ask if you were going to take any Tesla carbines to, you know, do some of the nuking on the 15 model team. But it sounds like you're just going for the reliability well, of four tax, three, four, five AP one. Right. So I, I'm playing on Into the Dark this week. So I Ooh. am going to go all Tesla because uh, oh, somebody okay. did the math at one point. And on Into the Dark, Tesla is literally always better than Goss. It is never not better than Goss. The lethal Again, five and the extra yeah. wound definitely just uh, shifts it up, huh? So yeah, I'll probably go. I and mean, I think the fact that it gets lethal five probably makes up for that, and that play still works. And you yeah. also get the bonus arc shock projector, so yep. that you can get a splash three range instead of splash two range. Yeah, splash three and inches. Is sick if you with give five. them Tesla weave, you know you can actually hurt people when they charge you. I doubt you're doing that though. It sounds like it sounds like no. you're be there for the arc shock projector phase blades, and then just yeah. uh, and then yep. just blowing them up, huh? Yeah, and you don't need to take the four up invuln against chaos cults with the uh, print or the cryptex, so that frees up three points for you. Um, but yeah, the the hyperphase blades on the immortals and the um, and the arc shock projectors on into the dark, uh, and I think the matchup becomes manageable. But I I still think cults win the matchup just because they're you know broken. But I think that higher tech has more play than your average team. I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Who else does higher tech have good play against? I think the last time you were here, you also talked about higher tech. Are there, have you learned any new higher tech stuff in the meantime? Uh, I haven't really gotten to like dedicate time to playing them, which is, that's why I'm playing them in CPTS. I was like, you know, let's just like mess around with higher tech. Um, I think higher tech is so cool. I'm not sure 
how sold I am on them competitively yet, but I'm, you know, I'm experimenting. Um, I see a lot of people say like it relies on the three up to reanimate a lot. And that is true, but I think you can like after the buffs, I think they kind of stand on their own almost as a team that where like, if you reanimate, it's a bonus rather than if you don't reanimate, you're, you're screwed. Right. I think they're like good enough on their own, maybe to, to compete, at least if the, if the current melee meta monsters get knocked down to, uh, to like a balanced state. Um, if the meta becomes a little more healthy, I think higher tech might be interesting. Um, I love them against like shooty hordes. Um, yeah, they just outshoot all the shooty hordes. Yeah. And like, they're you know you can they're against shooty hordes they're like actual flex models because the melee with a hyperphase blade is like pretty good it's like actually going to kill like a seven wound guardsman like reliably like there's not really a lot of variance there mm-hmm. um but yeah no i, I think higher tech is sick um the only i kind of like i want to see the internal balancing changed on that team i don't want to see them like straight up buffed or straight up nerfed I like I'd like to see the nano mine be worse and like the technomancer and maybe parts of the psychomancer made a little tiny bit better. So that way that's like a little bit more of a choice because I want to be able to run the psychomancer and the technomancer, but right now that nano mine is so valuable. Um yeah, for, for people who don't know, the nano mine is place one token within six inches of the uh, technomancer? Chronomancer. Chronomancer. And then each time anyone would move within six inches of the token you subtract two inches from the distance so that includes charge normal move and dashes yeah like if they made it so that it didn't affect dashes and and stuff like it just affected normal moves and charges i think that would be a lot more reasonable also it doesn't have to be i i think you should have to be able to have visibility of the spot where you place uh, it because yes, right now you can place it on the ghost other, abilities yeah you can place it on the other side of like an octarius wall that you can't even see which is like <laughs> so stupid um one of one of current i think right now felgor have that this team has it and then also hand of the archon all have uh, phasing abilities and i'm surprised they didn't tap those on data slate but i take it that the win rates aren't high enough where they have felt the need to yeah there's certain... they've only done it to teams that were too strong it looks like yeah like there's certain teams in this game that have things that are like really annoying and i wish would get changed but the teams aren't good enough to like warrant nerfing it like even warp coven i hated ephemeral instability for so long but you can't nerf warp coven you know what i mean like yeah. you shouldn't be nerfing warp coven yeah i there was there's like it would be nice if there was kind of a consistency patch that happened regularly but you know we'll see what happens over the next few months maybe things will be stuck for three months and nova and all the other tournaments will be trapped in melee summer but maybe gw will be generous they you know they just had the post about warhammer 40k talking about a july patch so maybe by the time this comes out oh. things will have uh, changed up a little bit if we get a july patch for kill team that's like christmas came early yeah I, it sounds like awesome. 40k is getting one so you know maybe by the time this comes out it'll be old news and you know we'll be talking about something else yeah or- no i there's so many things i want to play where like if the meta was just like regular like it was before ashes of faith and debatably gallifall I would be like super into playing certain things, but it's like, I feel like you almost kind of can't go to a tournament and expect to win with like 95% of factions. Now, if somebody shows up with cults and is like awake (laughs) and they definitely will. Yeah. Cults, cults is, cults is very strong right now. I think, you know, Hunter clade seem like they are kind of well situated for the matchup along with commandos on open for sure. That's a very rough matchup. It feel felt like, because on turn one, commandos are just so much more lethal than you are, and they're tough enough where the mutants are not necessarily dangerous. Mm-hmm. So, so there's a handful of teams, but it's not every team that can deal with cults. And I, I do agree that the polarization is not great, because we were in a pretty good spot before Ashes of Faith. Yeah, no, I think the game was like in an awesome spot right before that. Um, and I, I think this is just like a weird release, because... It like wasn't one of the core like I could totally see Felgors being balanced with like a small, you know, couple nerfs. Um, but like this team doesn't or this box doesn't feel like it was like 
I don't I don't even know what happened. Like I don't know if like yeah. the maybe the release was like put back or something and like maybe it wasn't always intended to not just be narrative. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here, but like it is a weird release in terms of power level for sure. It was a weird time weirdly timed release too. So who knows? Maybe it was a special GW team and they got uh a little bit a little bit too frisky with the rules you know it's not the first time a box set came out and the teams were balanced against each other and it came out a little weird yeah yeah, yeah, (laughs) oh god shellnath i yeah um at least so i mean at least both the teams are sick right yes i think design wise the teams hit these really nice sweet spots so with a little tap you know it'll be fine I think Inquisition agents probably have a really, really high skill cap because oh. there's so many different models and you're hitting on fours. So there's a lot of play. It's just cults are a very narrowing team where yeah. a lot of teams just don't have tools. So, and yeah, Inquisition, dude, that team is, um, it's like a, what's the term? Uh, like a sleeping giant. Do you have any uh, fun niche tactics for Inquisition? Because, you know, right now they're being played in World Team League and on Summer League, right? Have you seen anything cool to tell our listeners? I haven't got... I've only played against them once, and I haven't played as them yet. But um, So this is all theory, I guess, for the most part. Um, I think they are the second best team in the game. I don't know if that's a hot take. Uh, without cults, I think they would be the best team. Uh, but you are right. I think they are a real like high skill ceiling team. They're not like easy to pick up and just like crush with. It's more like a vet guard thing. But um, yeah, with I 13 models, that, they're basically vet guard. <laughs> yeah. And it's I mean, this is a team that could take like five AP one or AP two weapons on the board. And as an elite player, that is horrifying to me. Yes, um, they have the most most AP by a large margin. So they. They're basically the way I look at them is they're kind of like vet guard, but instead of having the veteran guard orders, they get counter spells. Yes, because you have all the same flexibility and the same number of models and the same elite matchup that's very polarizing, but you have no ability to really change your attacking roles where you're you're really hitting on fours a lot. Yeah. So like, I, there's a lot like the list building person in me really wants to pick up Inquisition mm-hmm. because. Like they're like I'm seeing use cases for like so many things and balancing that is exciting and fun for me. Yeah, so tell like us I about some use cases. Like Navis Breachers, I think are like the generic all comers, quote unquote. I you can run. Um, they're just so good. Like they just have so many good operatives. Um, I think personally I would take Vet Guard for the elite matchups to have the million AP two and AP one weapons. Um I I actually think there's play for Sisters of Silence. Um, this is a, it, a reliable, tough block that can do stuff because they hit on threes. I think against um, teams like Felgors, uh, I saw somebody saying Void Dancers, and it was like, yes, that makes so much sense. Um, I think there's a few matchup, and obviously Warp Coven, because that's a bunch of guys that they just straight up, or I guess a bunch of girls, they straight up cannot cast spells against or within six inches six inches of. Yep. Um, Wait. So, what about the sisters makes them good against the uh, void dancer troop? Is it that they have enough damage to fight in melee and reliably kill a void dancer if they start? Yeah. So, like, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, there are eight wounds, so they can't get one shot by kisses in melee. Yep. Um, and they have lethal five melee, which means they're getting around segrax easier, and they hit like okay. a truck. Yeah, they got um, power swords. Yeah, power 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 swords are really good against void dancers. So like they're a chassis that is not easy for void dancers to kill. And they're a body that can actually like wipe them in melee potentially, just straight up one for one. Um and that's pretty cool. Yeah. And they, I, you know, the three up save is good against shuriken pistols too. So Yeah, it's very interesting that the sisters, you know, because the team mostly hits on fours, or I think all hits on fours outside of like one model, I think the yeah. sisters are interesting because they provide a reliable block of three up, uh, you know, attack rolls, which yeah. just doesn't exist on the team. And they've got a little bit of upside on the handful of teams that do want to take psychers because they just ignore them, yeah. which, which is rough for those. Yeah. Uh, poor work. Yeah. Poor work. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that's really cool. Um, 
I want to find a use case for exaction squad with this team. Um, like being able, because like the subductors are such good models in a vacuum. And I think after the, the buffs, the, even the sniper. Great wounds now. Yeah. Yeah. Like the sniper is a little bit better. Um, the, you know, those shotgun bot, those shotguns are sick. They're really good. Um, so to like, and they've got a really good comms too, like second only to like the caster cannon scions comms. Yeah. Um, so to like put those models that are good in a vacuum, in my opinion, and put them on a much better team. That's like pretty intriguing, I think, against like some of the mid-range teams. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, I haven't really looked into the exaction interplay. I am very surprised that, you know, the breachers get six models because they're both tough and dangerous and they've yeah. got a lot of they've got a lot of wiggle room. And I think void armor actually exists on the model's data sheet, so they still get it. Yeah. And so does the ruthless um ruthless execution, execution or, or whatever it's called for the so the those shotgun guys for um so they can still shoot within six inches right yes into combat yeah all right you heard it here first folks the newly buffed exaction squad also good on inquisition i think so i just yeah. it, it is kind of a thing where i think the things you would take them against you'd probably take breachers against two and breachers are just like Probably too good. Well, like they should have five guys. Right? Yeah, Not they should be. They should be five guys for sure. Just the fact that you get an endurant with six with five other models seems <laughs> so silly to me. The endurant is just ridiculous. That's, what a silly guy. That said, you know, getting the subductors and getting the P one is pretty good actually because all five of your exaction squad guys they will get the P one critical hit rule for shooting within two inches of a friend. Yeah, so they can come in and help with exact with uh, Inquisition models and still get the P one, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. And I mean, Inquisition has so many; they can take all the archetypes. So I'm sure like Exaction is going to be better at certain things than than other you know yeah. ancillaries. So uh, there's definitely there's one of the funnier, of definitely one of the funnier abilities where we're like, ah, oh, thirty people on the team, you could do everything, and then very quickly realize like, no, you can't take everything, and you're going to have yeah. to sacrifice something somewhere. Yeah, all the but, things I just said sound cool. You can't put them all on the roster. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the cool things about Sisters of Silence is that like they have a lot of flexibility, but uh, you are only you only want to take exactly one set of them so you can take other stuff. So if you're you yeah. know going on all in the dark, taking five sisters with flamers would actually be really funny because they would just be great. It's just I would never take five flamers any other time, so I would never put it on the roster. Yeah. Yeah, you got to run the ultimate Inquisition lit roster where it's just the 12 Inquisition and then the 15 different types of Sisters of Silence. Yeah. Do you think there's any play for the actual just like never taking an ancillary support? I personally don't think so, but I'm curious if you've... If I you've don't know. Uh, somebody was talking about this the other day and I was like, it was like a light bulb moment where like, oh my God, that's a thing you can do. I like forgot about that after I read it the first time. Um. Who knows? I mean, who at that point, it's almost like a totally different team. Like, there's it's crazy because yeah. I just yeah. feel like that team is not good because it's just like all your models are just kind of dorks. But who knows? It's hard for me to know because I haven't seen the team in play. They're definitely a team that I'm looking at because I have a handful of Inquisition models and I've got the Exaction Squad sitting around on Sprue and it'd be cool. But Servitor Bros, man, the super Servitor Bros just hanging out and just blasting people from across the yeah. map wild sounds like that's an that's all the niche tactics we got in us today huh yeah probably that's all i got left i've run out of cool niche tactics to share <laughs> well there was a lot of cool ones so definitely thank you for that yeah of course it's always fun talking to you guys it's been fun and uh, congrats again on making it to atlanta we're hoping to see some cool command point coverage later this year huh oh yeah man if the meta is normal by then i it's gonna be so fun i just i just get to play something that i like and you know go against the best players and see how i do i'm just so i'm so excited yeah i mean coming from last year's event i think it will be really fun it's just really cool to hang out and play some really really competitive games and uh you know have a team i think it'll be hopefully you know by the time it comes around this year there is not one team that everyone is playing because last year it was like it was hunter clay and there was i think there were three players and i didn't want to be the fourth one so i was yeah, kind of struggling yeah. so hopefully this year you know we also have a much wider meta than we had last year too so nobody played an elite team last year 
at um yep everyone Mexico. everyone definitely avoided the elite teams if there's somebody playing an elite team this year at atlanta it'll probably be me <laughs> legionary maybe it'll be strike force justinian who knows who knows i'm actually excited to see the rules for that same all right listeners thank you for hanging out with us today and thanks again shane repeat first repeat hopefully not the last <sighs> historic yes thank you all for listening have a wonderful day um oh we should probably have a secret keyword for people that made it to the end of the episode that can join the discord and then come in saying thunderhawk and you know if you're the first one that says thunderhawk maybe you'll get a free gauge too Ooh.